word that I felt for 2021, um, this is what I felt God gave me about a month and a half ago, was, this, was, was two words, breaking chains. That 2021 would be a year of breaking chains. Last year, I really felt in 2020 that it would be a year where we would make decisions that would set the course of our lives for years to come. And in more ways than one, that has happened. Very different to what we expected. But it has happened in, in a very profound way. People have, in the, people have used COVID-19 as excuses for so many things and have started to set the trajectory, trajectory of their lives through decisions they've made based on fear, based on concern, based on, on uh, blaseness, based on a, a, a couldn't care less attitude, or based on what the Holy Spirit is saying. And uh, as we've made those decisions, wherever we find ourselves on that spectrum, we've set the trajectory of our lives. And of course, if we're heading down the road of fear, if we're heading down the road of concern, at any moment we can stop and we can repent and we can change course. Uh, but I really believe that last year was setting the stage for us for, for what God has got for us into the future and the direction we will go. And I pray that we um, will step into the things that we felt God call us to. And we will hold on to those things and we will run with those things and we will not shrink back. This year, I really believe, is a, is a year of breaking change. We changed our name last year from Gates of Praise Church, which is a great name, to Freedom Gate Church, which is a great name. And uh, it's a, it really is a prophetic declaration of what God wants to do in, in us and through us as a church. And uh, freedom is breaking chains. And uh, I really believe God is going to break chains of religion over people this year. God is going to break chains of self-doubt. He's going to break chains of disobedience. He's going to break chains of, of, of uh, lack of self-worth. Um, he's going to break change over, uh, chains over our lives and over our church as we step into the freedom of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we're going to live and we're going to walk and we, in the freedom of the gospel of Jesus. And we're going to see more clearly this gospel that he has called us to. We're going to speak more clearly this gospel that he has called us to. We're going to preach this gospel with more power, with more authority. Not just me, not just the leaders within this church, but every single one of us as the saints of God, called together as a family. We're going to preach the gospel. We're going to speak the gospel. And it's going to be followed by miracles, signs, and wonders, people being set free, people being healed, people being saved, people being delivered as they step into the freedom for which Christ has called us to be free. And just two scriptures to remind us of this. Isaiah 61 starts off by saying, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted and to proclaim liberty or freedom for the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. We're breaking chains this year. God is breaking chains this year. One of the biggest chains I feel that needs to be broken in our lives is the religious legalistic chain. We're going to break chains of legalism. We're going to break chains of religion. We're going to break chains of bondage over our thinking, over our thought patterns, over our hearts, so we can truly step into the freedom of the glorious grace of Jesus Christ as we, as we speak and as we live out his gospel. John 8 verse 36 says, So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Jesus is setting us free. Jesus is bringing us into greater levels and greater depths of freedom this year. And we will be free. We will not allow any man, any institution, any religion to hold us back and take us back into a place of bondage. But we will fight for and we'll keep moving forward into freedom in Jesus' name. Amen to that. Amen. So that's what I'm feeling for 2021. And I'm excited about this year. Um, it's, it's got God written all over it. And we get to run with him. Today I want to ask the question, where are the courageous dreamers? Where are the courageous dreamers? If you're able to type into the chat there, where are the courageous dreamers? Or type there, I am a courageous dreamer. I am a courageous dreamer. Turn with me as you've already hopefully got there to 1 Samuel 13. And we're going to listen to, read about an incredible story about Jonathan. Saul was the first king of Israel and he had a son called Jonathan. And Jonathan and Saul were together um, commanding the, the army and uh, they were going out to fight against the Philistines. And it was a rather dreary day. This was before the days of David and Goliath. Um, this was before the days where David had, uh, where, where had, had basically conquered the Philistines and put them to rout on every side. Um, and this was Saul at the, right at the beginning having to fight against these Philistines who were coming and wanting to conquer and take over the land of Israel. And uh, so we pick up the story in 1 Samuel 13 verse 1. It says, Saul lived for one year and then became king. And when he had reigned, I don't think Saul was one year old when he became king. I think it was one year after he'd been anointed as king. Um, but he became king and then he reigned for two years over Israel. 
Verse 2, Saul chose 3,000 men of Israel, 2,000 were with Saul in Michmash and the hill country of Bethel, and 1,000 were with Jonathan and Gabir of Benjamin. The rest of the people he sent home, every man to his tent. Right there in that moment, I would say Saul underestimated what he was about to face. So just remember, there were, how many people were there? There were 3,000 people, 2,000 with Saul and 1,000 with Jonathan. Verse 3, Jonathan defeated the garrison of the Philistines that was at Geba, and the Philistines heard of it. And Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. And all Israel heard it said that Saul had defeated the garrison of the Philistines, and also that Israel had become a stench to the Philistines, and the people were called out to join Saul at Gilgal. I don't know if you picked that up there, but Jonathan goes out, he defeats the garrison, and then Saul blows the trumpet, and all Israel hears, Saul has defeated the garrison. Um, something we do know about Saul as king is he had serious self-identity and self-worth issues and he was led by the fear of man more, more than the voice of the Lord and as a result Saul as you can see had serious issues taking credit for his own son's achievement God is calling you and me this year to deal with any issues inside of our hearts that that cause us to live and act and operate out of a place of insecurity but to operate from a place of worth and of value and of security because of whose we are. Verse 5. The Philistines mustered to fight with Israel. And wait for it. Here it comes. 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and troops like the sand on the seashore in multitude. And they came up and encamped in Michmash to the east of Beth Avon. When the men of Israel saw that they were in trouble, no kidding, for the people were hard pressed. <laughs> no kidding again. The people hid themselves in caves and in holes and in rocks and in tombs and in cisterns. And some Hebrews crossed the fords of the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. Saul was still at Gilgal and all the people following him trembling. Which kind of seems like the right response to the situation. Trembling. There's 2,000 of us with Saul, 1,000 with Jonathan, and then there are 30,000 chariots that means big chariots someone standing inside being pulled by horses 30,000 of them and then another 6,000 horsemen on horses without chariots right 6,000 horsemen that's all pretty intimidating then besides all that there are troops like the sand of the seashore now there's a lot of sand on the seashore that's a lot of troops that's a lot more than just the 3,000 that's kind of like having tro troops that like the sand of the seashore is like adding insult to injury. So you've got these 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen. You can't count the number of, of troops versus 3,000 men. Okay. I would say that Israel was in trouble. <laughs> and I love what the verse there says. It says, when the men of Israel saw that they were in trouble. <laughs> trouble has come. I think in 2020 we saw... We were in trouble and uh, we saw things coming our ways and and uh, they went and they hid themselves and i believe even today in 20 as we go into 2021 children of god there are famous hardy dogs children of god are hiding away in caves and in holes and in tombs and in cisterns you're hiding away right now maybe in caves of the fear of disease Maybe we're hiding away in the holes of unbelief. Maybe we're hiding away in the tombs of past mistakes and regrets. Perhaps some of us are hiding away in the systems of unfulfilled expectations. There are all these men hidden all over the place because they knew they, had, they could not stand against this incredible, fierce army coming their way. Verse 8, so Saul waited seven days, the time appointed by Samuel, who was the man of God who came with the word of God. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattering from Saul. And again, the insecurities in Saul flare up. The fear of man flares up. And so Saul said, bring the burnt offering here to me and the peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. As soon as he had finished offering the burnt offering, as soon as he had finished offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came, and Saul went out to meet him and greet him. Saul had disobeyed God by doing this. If you read the next few verses, you'll see that Saul disobeyed God. And Samuel asked Saul the question, what have you done? I wonder how many Christians 
have done something one step ahead of God. They've made a decision based on the fear of man, a decision based on the fear of disease, a decision based on the fear of what's happening around us. And they've been just one step ahead of God. Saul, if he'd waited just a little bit longer, Samuel would have arrived. But it says as soon as he finished the burnt offering, Samuel arrived. Saul was impatient. And how often we as Christians can be impatient. All of what I'm saying right now is setting the scene for what we're about to get into, the main point. But Samuel asked the question, what have you done? And then Saul goes and defends himself. And he explains himself. How often we explain and defend ourselves in what we would consider human wisdom. Saul explains, no, but the people were scattering from me. I had to do something to keep them together. You know what God said to Saul as a result of his disobedience and his rebellion and not obeying the word of God? God said, you've lost the kingdom. For Saul, he lost the inheritance that God had given him. And my prayer for you and for me in 2021, that we will not be one step ahead of God, that we will not be impatient, that we will not operate out of fear and step into human wisdom and as a result, lose the inheritance that God has for us in this year. It seems so good on the surface, doesn't it? What Saul did seems so good on the surface. This, it, I've got to do something to gather the people, but it was blatant disobedience. I want to say to you and to me today, I'm speaking to myself first and to all of us watching online, do not put a time limit on God. Do not put a time limit on God in this season. Learn to thrive in this season. Learn to, to walk in faith in this season. Understand the secret of joy, the secret of peace in this season, but do not put a time limit on God. Do not rush God. Sometimes God delays an answer so that we, to see what you and I will do. He delays to expose our default settings. And it's your job and my job then to see what our default settings are and then change the default settings. We need to change the de default settings. Saul defaulted back to figuring out something in his human understanding so that he could protect his reputation and keep the people with him. We need to be so careful not to default. <clears throat> so many Christians in 2020 have defaulted back to patterns and habits of spiritual life that have been lying dormant under the surface. But the perfect storm of COVID-19 and lockdown and all the other things that have come have sent them back into default. Let us not be those Christians. Let us keep pressing forward and holding on to the word of God and walking patiently. So many default settings have come to the surface. Things that have lain underneath there. And the, the season and this environment that we found ourselves in has been the perfect environment to allow these things to grow. And we've had, as Christians, we've, we've seen weeds and all sorts of other nasty, ugly issues and challenges and self-attitudes going on inside of us that have risen to the surface. And we've become a little bit selfish, self-centered. It's about me. It's about my comfort. Even I'm protecting myself has actually become self-centeredness. And we're missing out on what God has got for us. And my challenge to you and to me today is let's not be like Saul. Let's step into godly wisdom. Let's change our default settings. Let's hold on to him because he's got something incredible he wants to do in this season. For some of us, it means getting out of bed. Not necessarily now. If you're in bed, don't, that you're welcome to stay in bed. But it means getting out of bed early in the morning and say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to press into God. I've allowed my quiet time to slip. I'm not, no longer reading my Bible. I'm going to get up and I'm going to start to press into him again. And I'm going to ask God, what is on your heart? What is your priority? What do you value? And I'm going to go after those things. I'm not going to default. Verse 15b, it says, second half verse 15, it says, Saul numbered the people who were present with him, about 600 men. So we see at the end of all of this, even what Paul did didn't prevent the men from scattering. He'd already lost a whole bunch of people to holes and cisterns and caves and tombs. So now the 3,000, we don't know if Jonathan still had his 1,000, but we know that Saul had 2,000 and now he only had 600. But the army of the Philistines hadn't gone away. Same number of the army, even less people with him. I want to move over to talking a little bit about Jonathan, but I want to say this. Only you know and only I know if we are still standing, holding the line like the 600, or if we've retreated back into a hole, each of us has to answer this question for ourselves. Have we retreated? Or are we still standing, holding the line? Do we still believe God and trust God for what he's called us to? 
The verses go on to say that there was no blacksmith in Israel. The Philistines had made sure of that. The enemy, they'd made sure of that. So the, the Israelites had to go to the enemy to get their farming tools sharpened. And so the enemy made sure that they had no spears. They had no swords. They had no weapons of war. The only two people in the whole of Israel had a spear or a sword or a sword was Saul and Jonathan, his son. The rest of them had like hoes and axes and other weird, well, maybe not even an axe. They had just other farming implements because the Philistines had made sure that the Israelites couldn't arm themselves. And you know, the enemy through 2020 and before and into this year, he's going to try and make sure that you and I can't arm ourselves. He's going to try to strip us of that which we can use to fight against them. And he does that through lies. He does that through lying at us about our identity, lying at us about our value, lying at us about our protection, lying at us about our future, lying at us about our family and our friends and our jobs and society and what's happening around us. And we step in and if we start to believe those lies, we lose ground and we lose the weapons that you and I have that we've been called to, to, to fight this battle that he's got for us in 2021 so verse 22 says so on the day of battle there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of all the people except Saul uh, when Saul and Jonathan uh, it was all the people sorry we say it again on the day of battle there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of all the people who were with Saul and Jonathan but only Saul and Jonathan his son had them and the garrison of the Philistines went out to the pass of Michmash so the scene is set Disaster awaits. And the question I asked right at the beginning of today's message about the courageous dreamers. The scene is set, disaster awaits, and the courageous dreamers awake. They awake. In this case, in this story, one courageous dreamer awakes. My question for you and for me, will we be the courageous dreamers who awaken in this perfect storm that we are facing as we go into 2021? 1 Samuel 14. One day, here's the courageous dreamer, Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man who carried his armor, Come, let us go over to the Philistine garrison on the other side. But he did not tell his father. When we know about how Saul had operated, how paranoid he was, how fearful he was, and how he was just trying to protect himself and his own reputation, you can completely understand why Jonathan did not tell his father. This is an amazing story. I want to remind you again. 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and troops larger than the sands of the sea, and one man from Israel. One man and his armor bearer. Two people. They say, we're going to just see what God could do. Within the passes, verse 4, by which Jonathan sought to go over to the Philistine garrison, there was a rocky crag on the one side and a rocky crag on the other side. This is important for us to understand just how difficult this was going to be. Not just the fact that it was two against many, but the fact of where Jonathan had to actually go to get to the many. The name of the one was Bozes and the name of the other, Sina. That's the name of the two rocks on either side, these two big rocky outcrops, and there was this pass going through in the middle. The one crag rose on the north in front of Michmash and the other on the south in front of Geba. Jonathan said to the young man who carried his armor, Come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. Can you see the absolute disdain that Jonathan carries for the enemy? As vast as they are, as strong as they are, as mighty as they are, and as little in numbers as he is, just two of them, he just calls them these uncircumcised Philistines. The reason for that is because he had a covenant with God. And he knew it. One man, in this case, two men, with a covenant with God, can do more than a vast army that has no covenant with God. And I want to say the enemy has no covenant with God. That which is coming at you and me today as we go into 2021 has got no covenant with God. You and I have the covenant with God through Jesus Christ. Verse 6, Jonathan said to the young man who carried his armor, Come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. And his armor bearer said to him, do all that is in your heart. Oh God, give us more people like that. When you say, hey, let's just see what God could do. And the person standing next to you says, just do all that's in your heart. Let's go for it. I'm with you all the way. Do as you wish. Behold, I'm with you, heart and soul. Then Jonathan said, behold, we will cross over to the men and we will show ourselves to them. Here's Jonathan's battle strategy. If they say to us, wait until we come to you, 
then we will stand still in our place and we will not go up to them. But if they say, come up to us, then we will go up for the Lord has given them into our hand and this shall be a sign for us. I don't know about you, but there are a hang of a lot of holes in that battle strategy. So both of them showed themselves to the garrison of the Philistines and the Philistines said, look, Hebrews are coming out of the holes in which they've hidden themselves. And the men of the garrison hailed Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, come up to us. We will show you a thing. Doesn't that sound like the school bully sitting in the corner of the field saying, hey, come over here and I will show you a thing. And you know, as you head over there, head down, walking over to the bully because you've really got no other option, you know you're about to get a beating or about to be ridiculed or ashamed or something's about to happen to you because of the school bully. And here's the school bully, the Philistine garrison. Come up to us and we will show you a thing. Basically they say. Come up to us and we'll show you a thing. You're too stupid to realize that when you get to us, we will kill you. We will kill you. We'll show you a thing. The arrogance and the pride of the enemy. Jonathan says to his armor bearer, Come up after me, for the Lord has given them into our hands. Jonathan says, I laid out this ridiculous battle strategy. This ridiculous sign, the sign has appeared, God's given them into our hands, let's go. I'm not going to sit around in a tomb and assist them under a tree just waiting with trembling men. I'm not going to wait any longer, but I'm going to go out there because we, there might be 36,000 chariots and horsemen out there and multitudes of people, but I have God on my side. And so I'm going to go out and I'm going to do something ridiculous. I'm going to do something that looks stupid. I'm going to do something that makes absolute no sense according to worldly wisdom. I'm going to go out there and exercise ridiculous faith, reckless faith. And perhaps God is with us. And perhaps God will do something. But when I see the sun, when I see what's happening, I say, hey, God has given them into our hands. Come, let's go and do it. 600 trembling men, a whole bunch more hiding in holes and caves. But, but Jonathan says, the Lord has given these people into our hands. It's an amazing story. You've got to see the context. You've got to see what's happening. You've got to picture what's going on and just realize how absolutely ridiculous this is. Verse 13, Jonathan climbs up on his hands and feet. That's how steep it was. He had to climb up on his hands and his feet. And his armor bearer after him. And they fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer killed them after him. So John, you can just imagine Jonathan climbing up on his hands and feet, maybe grabbing the guy as he gets to him, grabbing him by his leg and pulling him, and the guy falls and lands behind him, and his armor bearer chops off his head, and then Jonathan climbs a little bit higher, grabs the next guy, and pulls him to the ground, and the armor bearer you know, stabs him in the heart. Is this a PG service? This is probably, my kids are watching. Um, but this is in the Bible. They were, they, they were killing them. The, the armor bearer was killing them after Jonathan as he went forward. Isn't that amazing? that this team that they, that they, they were two with, with God is more than a multitude. And after their first strike, which Jonathan and his armor bearer made, killed about 20 men within half a, 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 a length of an acre. And 20 men dead. Remember how many people they actually had. 20 men dead. Listen to what happens in verse 15. And there was panic in the camp. All it took was two men saying, we're going to believe God for the ridiculous take out and wipe out 20 men. And there was panic in their camp. Panic. In the field, among all the people, the garrison and even the raiders trembled. The earth quaked. The whole earth began to quake because of the panic and the trembling. It says, and it became a very great panic. Now remember how many people there were in the enemy army. And it became a very great panic in that army. Verse 20. Saul and all the people who were with him rallied and went into battle. And behold, every Philistine's sword was against his fellow. The enemy turned on itself. And there was very great confusion. Now the Hebrews who had been with the Philistines before that time, who had gone up with them into the camp, even they also turned to be with the Israelites who were with Saul and Jonathan. This is what I believe in God for this year as we see chains breaking. That those who've sided with the enemy, those who believe the lies of the enemy, will turn and will repent and will come together again. And we will, this church, Freedom Gate, will pull together as a community, as a gathering of believers, and we will see the enemy run and be routed in Jesus' name. And then it says, Likewise, when all the men of Israel who had hidden themselves in the hill country of Ephraim heard that the Philistines were fleeing, they too followed hard after them into battle. 
just took one man to say, let's trust God for the ridiculous. And everyone had hidden in the tubes and the cisterns of fear and regret and past mistakes stood up and said, hey, we can go with God. We can do this thing again. We can run with God and we're going to see the enemy routed before us. So the Lord saved Israel that day. Verse 23, the Lord saved Israel that day. It says the battle passed beyond Beth Haven. From that moment onwards, Saul kept conquering and kept harassing the Philistines. Eventually along came a young man called David who said again, who is this dog that he would defy the armies of the living God? And Goliath went down and more routing took place. And over and over and over and over again, the Philistines were defeated over and over and over again because Israel had a covenant with God. It's an incredible story. Incredible story. And I want to ask us again today, we are the courageous dreamers. We are the ones who will do the ridiculous so that God can do the miraculous. We are the ones who will do the ridiculous so that God can do the miraculous. We are the ones who refuse to sit around in holes and tombs and wait for the seemingly inevitable but will take the battle to the enemy. We will say, we're facing a battle. We've come out of a battle and it hasn't ended. We're facing this battle going into 2021 and we're going to take the battle to the enemy. All it takes, guys, is just a few of us. It just takes a few of us. Just a few courageous dreamers who can stand again, who can hold the line, who can say, we're going to run. We're going to go for it. And we will start to see people coming out of holes and out of caves and out of cisterns and out of tombs and joining in and God's army, God's church will rise again as a mighty church, as a mighty army to conquer and rout the devil and, his, and, and the demons and every, every, every plan, every purpose that he has laid out to see those plans and purposes routed in the name of Jesus because of a few courageous dreamers. A few courageous dreamers. There is nothing that stops the Lord from saving by many or by few, Jonathan said. We're the ones who will say, perhaps the Lord is going to work for us in this. We're the ones who will say, we recognize that God can save by many or by few. So let him use us. Let him use us few. Let's do this. Too many, too many, too many Christians have retreated into their safe places. And God is looking for those who will say, Lord, I'm willing to be ridiculous for you. I'm willing to stick my neck out. I'm willing to crawl uphill on my hands and knees in prayer and in action. And perhaps you will honor my reckless faith. I use the word reckless on purpose because it seems so reckless to, it seems so reckless to the dignified Christian. It seems so reckless to the moderate Christian. It seems so reckless to the Christian who says, hey, let's exercise a little bit of wisdom here. There is nothing that looks like human wisdom about what Jonathan was about to do. It seemed incredibly, ridiculously reckless. And God used that moment to save a nation, to save a nation and rout an enemy. I believe God is stirring up people this morning. You and I are watching online this morning. He's stirring us up, stirring us up as a people who will refuse to sit around any longer. But we'll get down on our hands and knees and begin to pray as if the church depends on my prayer and on your prayer. A people who will begin to read the Bible and ask the question, what stops the Lord from saving by many or by few? A people who will shake off the caves and the holes and the cisterns and the tombs and say, I'm coming out. I'm going to hold the line. I'm going to pick a fight. And I'm going to take the fight to the enemy. For too long in 2020, the enemy confused people and lied to people and forced us into hiding in the name of a human wisdom. It's time to rise in godly wisdom and take back what the enemy has stolen. We need to drive our stake into the ground of the goodness of God as we preached last week's Sunday. What the enemy meant for evil, God will turn it out and turn it around for good. Drive our stake into the goodness of God. If God is for me, who can be against me? If God is for me, who can be against me? He can save by many. He can also save by few. I'm going to climb out of my hole. I'm going to climb out of self-pity. I'm going to climb out of fear. I'm going to climb out of regret. I'm going to climb out of unforgiveness. I'm going to climb out of lost opportunities. And I'm going to run with what he's got for me. I'm going to crawl on my hands and knees if that's what it takes. And I'm going to go for it. And it's going to look ridiculous. The seemingly ridiculous. The seemingly reckless. But God is going to fight a mighty battle and win a mighty battle on your behalf and on my behalf this year in 2021. 
Amen? Antonin Scalia passed away a few years ago. He was one of the chief justices in the United States. And I saw this quote of his the other day, and I want to read this. God assumed from the beginning that the wise of the world would view Christians as fools. And he has not been disappointed. In other words, God has not been disappointed. If I have brought any message today, it is this. Have the courage to have your wisdom regarded as stupidity. We are the courageous dreamers. Have the courage to have your wisdom regarded as stupidity. Be fools for Christ and have the courage to suffer the contempt of a sophisticated world. That was Antonin Scalia, one of the most famous and most well-regarded chief justices of America. God assumed from the beginning that the wise of the world would view Christians as fools and he has not been disappointed. So you and I be fools for Christ. Have the wisdom, have the courage, sorry, have the courage to suffer the contempt of a sophisticated world. That we have the courage to walk in wisdom that the world calls stupidity. That we have the courage to dream. May we have the courage to put our neck out and watch God back up our faith this year. Let's pray.